Nada. Praise the Lord. Welcome to another new week, right? Praise the Lord. The Sabbath is over and we have another week ahead of us as we continue to unveil Revelation and we are actually going into the last week of this seminar, right? The last week and as I said, it's going to get, we still not, we're still not all the way in. We're walking in and we're getting deeper and deeper. But as you saw this morning and today, things are getting very deep very quickly, right? Praise the Lord for those things because we're unveiling Revelation. Your life is about to change forever. And probably some people, they've already told me that they've been shaken to the bone with the things that we are learning. But praise the Lord because God is showing us these things because He loves us and He wants to prepare us. Amen? Praise the Lord. So remember, uh, when you come to seven presentations, you receive the first DVD, the final events of Bible prophecy. Tonight is actually the fourth team presentation and you receive the... Cosmic Conflict, The Origin of Evil. How many people received their, their DVD tonight, right? Those are people that have not missed one night. They have come consistently. Praise the Lord to every presentation. And next week, next Sabbath, when we finish, right, we're giving out the last DVD, which is Revelation, The Bride, The Beast, and Babylon, right, which is touching on a lot of the things that we've been covering, especially since last night and the things that are forthcoming to cover. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to tell you the schedule for the remainder of this seminar, all right? So that you know, so you can schedule and you can be prepared. Tomorrow at 7 o'clock, what are we jumping into? The enemy's, the enemy's greatest lie revealed. We're going to see as we can start tonight with the abominations of Babylon, we are going to see the, this lie. Now, sadly, this lie, my loved ones, has most Christians deceived. Most Christians have eaten up or chewed on this lie that the enemy has. Amen? So what does that mean? That if we call ourselves Christians, that means we need to come tomorrow because we do not want to be deceived that with other things. Amen? Praise the Lord. God is revealing things. He is unraveling things so that we can be prepared. This is an enemy and this has to do very directly with one of the topics that we're going to be covering in the end towards the end times. On Monday, we come in at 7 o'clock and it's Revelations Lake of Eternal fire, right? Revelation's lake of eternal fire. And the question is, what is the lake of fire? Where is the lake of fire going to be? And how long is it going to last? Amen? Fascinating topic. This is one of my other favorite topics as they all are because they are preparing us, right? Each one of these nights, beginning tonight, tomorrow, and Tuesday, we're going to be jumping into the abominations of Babylon. And we're going to be talking about that in a, in a minute. Tuesday is the worst of the abominations. The worst of the abominations, and that is called the mark of the beast. As we've been looking at this Babylonian system that is rising up and coming together, we are going to see that the mark of the beast is their trademark. It's what is going to be imposed on the world that has to do with this false system of worship. And what is the mark of the beast? Is it a microchip? Is it a tattoo? Is it a computer? Blah, 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 blah. If God, as we've seen, has warned us about the beast has warned us about the image, and is warning us about the mark of the beast, God is going to tell us exactly what those things are where. In? In His Word. Amen? We don't have to come up and try to guess these things. The Bible will tell and explain these things very, very clearly to all of us. Praise the Lord, because God is not trying to hide anything. God is revealing. Amen? Wednesday, we're going to jump into Matthew chapter 24, which I like to call Revelation chapter 23. Right? Because it's only three weeks, these seminars usually last four to five weeks. So there are a lot of topics that I had to cut out, but I want to definitely cover this topic, and it's the marriage in the times of Noah. Jesus says, my coming will be as it was in the times of Noah when they were drinking, eating and drinking, marrying and giving into marriage. Fascinating that that is not directly a quotation to the world, because that's what we say. Oh, people are just, they're all over the place. They're getting drunk. They're doing all. No, no, no. That message is for the church because God, very rarely does God speak to those that are not from the church because they don't believe in him, right? We are the ones supposed to be the messengers, the angels of God to those that don't know it through our life, through our consecration, through our uh, testimony. Amen? Then Thursday you're off. Then on Friday we come at 7 o'clock. Revelation reveals what? The bride of Christ. The Bible says that Christ is going to come and take his bride. Amen? The question is, who is the bride of Christ? And this is a fascinating, fascinating topic. Loving topic. You're going to be blown away by this topic. We're going to cover about two to three fascinating prophecies, as we're going to do also on Wednesday as we continue. Then we're going to return on Sabbath, right? 
As we did this Sabbath, we came this morning to listen to the image of the beast, but now I'm going to give you a little treat. I'm warming you up because I want you to come a little bit earlier. Because why? Because I, I, there's so much I want to give and I don't have enough time to give all these topics. But what we have is called Sabbath school at 9.30 in the morning before we have our worship service, right? And there we get together and we study topics. This, this uh, trimester we're studying the book of Jeremiah. But I'm going to give a special class this Sabbath, next Sabbath coming. And the class is, or the study is on, who is the Archangel Michael? We saw in Revelation 12, it says that the Archangel Michael, he was battling the devil, right? And he beat the devil. And he was battling him with his army. So this Mark Archangel Michael is a fascinating character. We're going to study it biblically and see who is the Archangel Michael and how this all plays out because this has to do with prophecy because he also shows up in Daniel chapter 12, which has to do with the end times. Amen? Then, and our worship service, 1045, the topic is Armageddon and the seven last plagues of Revelation. We're going to talk and jump into Revelation chapter 16, and Revelation chapter 16 is talking about the seven last plagues that are going to fall on this earth, and as I shared with you already, the seven last plagues of Revelation are going to undo the six days of creation. This earth is going to return to its empty and abysmal state that it was in Genesis before creation. Amen? Fascinating topic. You're going to love this topic. It's one of my favorite as well. Then that same Sabbath, we are also going to have a what? The baptismal ceremony. Amen? Now, we, we split it up in two dates. We're going to do it this coming Sabbath and the following coming Sabbath, which is November 7th and October 31st for a number of different reasons. But that way, you know, some people might be ready for this Sabbath. Some people might a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit longer, whatever the case. And then after that, if somebody else needs to, the, baptis the baptistry is, is, that's what it's there for. Amen? For people to turn their lives over to see Jesus Christ. So some, lots of you have made decisions for Christ. We've been meeting with some of them, with some of you, uh, little by little. And we will continue to do during this week because the, that's a good problem to have, right? We have quite a few people. So we're going to be sitting down with you, talking about these things and confirming the decisions of people that want to turn their lives over to Christ, that want to be baptized. Amen? And then we finish Saturday night at 7 o'clock with the last topic, the millennium and your eternal vacation. Amen? The millennium, right? The Bible says in Revelation chapter 20 that the devil is going to be tied down, right? In this abyss. What is going on, right? What is going on with this? What is going on during the millennium, before the millennium, and after the millennium? All of this we're going to talk about. Revelation is very clear on all these things, and we're going to be studying them and talking about them. Fascinating, fascinating stuff, and this has to do with the second and third stage of judgment. Amen? We have talked about the first one, which is happening as we speak, but we are going to be talking about the second and third uh, dimension of judgment. Today's topic is Amazing Facts Presents Babylon the Harlot and Her and Her Abominations. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the opportunity to come together as we continue to study your word, to open it, to, to see the wonderful prophecies that you have in the book of Revelation. We thank you, Father, for your Sabbath day that has passed. Uh, as we begin a new week, we ask for your blessings. We ask that you help us to, to stay strong as you keep on sending your manna for six days and then next Sabbath that we may come together again and, and no manna falls for all of the praises and all the worship go up for you on your Sabbath day, Father. We ask a special blessing for those that also went through the waters of baptism to give their lives over to Christ, Father, and there are many others that are interested, Father, that, that we may be prepared, that we can continue to help and walk towards you so that we can all be ready for what your soon return, uh, the soon return of your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the blessing as we study this fascinating topic, and we ask that your Holy Spirit will not only give us an understanding of the things that we are going to study, but also give us the strength to obey. Thank you for this blessing, Father, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go with me, please, to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, which we know we've been studying. You should probably know it by now. I know it by memory in Spanish. I don't know it by memory in English yet because I do this so much. It's teaching Revelation chapter 14, right? The last message that God has. We said Revelation chapter 12, 13, and 14 are the climax, right? The climax of this great controversy between Christ and the enemy and Satan, right? And chapters 12, 13, and 14 are talking about this. We've been covering them in great detail in the last couple of days. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. Is everybody there? 
Amen. It says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, every tribe, every tongue, and every people, every single human being, my loved ones, that we have studied, was going to listen to this everlasting gospel before the end. Before the end, before the close of probation, God is sending this message out to everybody because you are going to have to make a decision in the end times, which are now. You are going to have to make a decision as these things start to come up and these events that we're going to be talking about start happening. You're going to have to make a decision or to follow God and his word and receive the seal of God or to follow, to follow man, to follow tradition, to follow the Vatican, to follow Babylonian system. And what? And receive the mark of the beast. This is the final chapter in this great controversy. This is the end as God is going to bring it. God's mercy is infinite and eternal for those that love him and worship him and honor him. But God's mercy has a limit. And God has shown that his mercy is going to be cut off. It's going to come to an end for those thick-necked, stiff-necked, arrogant people, that rebellious people that don't want to listen. God is, is, has this probation open for all. Amen? Amen? And this last message is going out to the world. And it says, verse number 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made the heaven, the earth, the seas, and the springs of water. This first angel message is saying what? Restore the principles. Restore the principles that I established through my son Jesus Christ with the church, with the primitive church. God is saying, bring those principles back because as we have seen, the papacy has stepped on those principles. The Vatican has put aside the word of God and has followed tradition. And God is calling us to not pay attention, not listen to the beast, not obey them, to follow the word of God and the word of God only. Amen? And that's what God is calling us to do. Why? Verse number eight. And another angel said, following, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornications. That's what we're touching on tonight. Babylon is going to fall. Why? Because Babylon does not want to listen, does not want to preach, does not want to teach that first angel's message, which is calling to restore God's principles amongst his people. Babylon doesn't want to listen. Babylon wants to do her own thing. And that's why the Bible says that Babylon will fall. And why all of those that are inside or that obey and listen to Babylon and her teachings? Verse number nine. Then a third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships or if anyone obeys the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation and shall be tormented with fire and brimstones in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. God's final warning to the earth. This is a warning of love. This is a message of love before probation is end. God is going to end with this world. Amen? God is going to finish with this world, but he wants everybody to hear it, to give everybody a chance to come out, to give God and to live by his word and follow his word. Amen? You want to worship God? Obey God. Obey his word. And that's what God is asking for us. And we see that this everlasting gospel is in the heavenly sanctuary, right? Revelation is occurring in the heavenly sanctuary, and this is the message. And as we go across and we study the beast and the image of the beast, which is the second beast, we saw that that beast power, that antichrist power that sits in the place of God, says to be God and to take the prerogatives of God and says that can do the things that only God says can do, we saw that that's the office of the papacy, right? We're not talking about Catholics. Remember, we're talking about the system, the institution. It's an antichrist system. It's a antichrist institution. We didn't even have to say it. They said it themselves last night, right? That's what we're talking about. They said it. We have the power of God to even change God's holy law. And we saw all of the evidence, abundance amount of evidence. I'm going to be sending you all of these things. Get your emails ready. Get your computers ready because you're going to be flooded with information. Amen? And we saw that that second beast that is going to give, relive the papacy, right? It received its water wound. It says after 2,600, 2,600 days or years, in 1798, the prophecy was pinpoint accurate. The papacy's power was taken away, civil power was taken away, and it received its mortal wound. But the prophecy says that that wound is going to be healed by the second beast or the second superpower that rises up after the year 1798. And we saw the prophecy, saw it this morning, we saw a little bit of it today, 
And sadly, it hurts us to say, but prophecy says it, that this country that we love is the second world power that is going to relive and give the papacy back its civil power. We're going to be seeing that as we continue throughout this seminar, as we continue. And this, my loved ones, this is the beginning of Babylon. As the same way that God has his trinity, the Holy Father, the Holy Son, and the Holy Spirit, so does the enemy. And the enemy also has the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, or the second beast. And this is the systems that are coming together to once again enforce this system of false worship on the world. But it is in Babylon that we are going to focus on because I told you, and we've talked it, that in Revelation chapter 13, it's focusing more on the political aspect of the Vatican, right? But now we're going to see as we go into Revelation 17 that it's going to focus on the religious part of Babylon. It's going to focus on the religious impositions that is coming out of the Vatican that is going to happen. So when we just read that Babylon is Babylon is fallen because she has made all of the, earth, of, the, of the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, we have the details. That verse right there is going to be expounded and enlarged and detailed in Revelation chapter 17. Go with me, please, to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation 17 is going to give us now more information regarding Babylon. Regarding this system, Revelation chapter 17 is where it starts to get fascinating. Is everybody following me? Everybody keeping up? Everybody awake? Praise the Lord. Revelation 17 says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came to and talked with me, saying to me, Come and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on what? On many waters. Now, we know that a woman in Bible prophecy represents a, a church or God's People. So if this is a harlot, it's an adulterous woman. It means it's a church that's the what? That's not being faithful to her husband. And who is supposed to be the husband of, of the church? Christ. Christ is supposed to be the husband of this church. But this church is not paying attention. Why? Look at what it says. Who is she being adulterous with? Who with the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So instead of being loyal to her husband, she is doing what? She is fornicating with the kings of the earth, which you know what that means, that we already seen, is what? Church and state coming together. The church not following Christ and his word, but doing what? Being bedfellows with the kings of this earth. Now, Revelation chapter 12 speaks about this woman. She is poor, pure. She is covered with the glory of God, this faithful woman. Right? It's God's faithful church in Revelation chapter 12. But it also says that she is being attacked by what? By a dragon that has seven heads and ten? Ten horns. And throughout Revelation chapter 12, it says that she is being attacked by this dragon with seven heads and ten horns, which we already know and we're going to be reviewing again. And it says in Revelation 12, 17, that the dragon makes war in the end times with the church. Those that do what? That keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. But then we saw in Revelation chapter 13, how is the devil, how is the dragon going to carry out his war on his church? It then says in Revelation 13 with the what? With the beast that has seven heads and ten? Seven heads and ten horns. This is repetitive so that nobody can come up with this. And fascinating to know that in Revelation chapter 17, guess who's sitting on the beast with seven heads and ten horns? It's that woman or that church, that adulterous church that is sitting there. Is everybody following me? We continue in Revelation chapter 17. Let's go there. Revelation chapter 17. So he carried me away in the, in the spirit in the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a what? On a scarlet beast which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adored with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden what? A golden cup. Now this woman, fascinating, this woman is the one that is going to be making the war on the other woman because she's sitting on the beast that is attacking the church in Revelation chapter 12 and chapter 13. So this attack is being directed by who? By this woman, by this adulterous woman that is sitting where? On the beast. Now I have a question. Who is dominating this relationship? The woman or the beast? The woman. Right? When, I was, when I was younger and my, my sister and my cousins, they were smaller. Now they're bigger, almost bigger than me. 
right? I used to grab them by the arm, and I used to twist their arm, and I would sit down on them. What was I telling them? I'm in charge, right? Who's in charge of this relationship here? That woman, that adulterous woman is sitting on the church. The church is sitting on the state and telling the state what to do. Isn't that exactly what happened during the 1,260 years? The states of Europe did what they, whatever the Vatican wanted. They were at her hand, at her mercy, and they basically did that for almost 2,300, for 1,260 years. My loved ones, this is the battle of Armageddon. This is the final battle in Revelation. It's not this, this theory that most Christians are following, saying that Russia and China are going to come and they're going to invade the Middle East and then the Jews and then... No, blah, blah, blah. That's the smokescreen. Almost most of Christians are all looking to the Middle East thinking that the prophecies are going to be fulfilled there, but Jesus said this sanctuary is left desolate. This sanctuary has no value. And we're looking at the battle. It's saying, don't look at the Middle East and Jerusalem. Look at Rome. That's where the prophecies are going to be fulfilled. That's where we have to be paying attention to the things. And not only Rome, but right here too. Right? Right here too. As the coming together of this Babylonian system. Is everybody following me? Amen? Now, uh, I lost my, I didn't follow my rules. Revelation chapter 17. We're going to read through it, and then we're going to just break it down. I was on verse number 4. I didn't finish number four, I think, right? The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and of the what? And of the abominations of? Of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Talking about those dead in the persecution during... The 1,260 years, but also talking about the ones that are going to be in the end times. Those two groups. Now, what does Babylon mean? Genesis chapter 11, verse 9. That's why it is called Babel, because there the Lord did what? Confused the language of all the earth. Babylon means confusion. That's why she is called Babylon, because she has the world drunk or confused regarding God's plan of salvation. Is everybody following me? Now, as we go back, let's start to break down this woman in detail. Revelation chapter 17, and I keep on closing my Bible because this Bible closes. It says, verse number one, number two. Yes, one. Come and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. We know that waters represent what? People, multitudes, nations. So this is what? This is a woman or a church that is sitting or dominating who? The world. It says, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So this is what? This is a church that is not loyal to her husband, but she is what? She has entered into an illicit relationship with the state, with the kings of this earth, with the governments. Amen? This is what it's saying. What is it? Church and state. Now, that illicit relationship has produced a certain wine because it says she had committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So this illicit relationship between the church and... And the state has produced wine that has who? That has everybody drunk. Now, when you're drunk, are you thinking straight? No. Are you seeing things correctly? No, you're not. You're all over the place, right? Your frontal lobe is out of the door. Your alpha is down. Your, 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 your judgment is out the door. And you're just basically following your flesh and following your senses. So what she's saying here is that what's happening? The world is drunk. They're not paying attention. They're not following the word of God. Is everybody with me? And it continues to say, So she carried me away in the spirit in the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So uh, let's see, the beast in prophecy we know is the, the Roman Empire, right? In its five stages. A woman sitting on Rome. A church sitting on Rome. Can the prophecy be any more, more accurate than that? That great beast which is seven heads. What represents the seven heads? Seven what? Let's look at Revelation chapter 17, verse 9. 
Revelation chapter 17, verse 9. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven what? Seven mountains on which the woman sits. Fascinating. Catholic Encyclopedia, page 529. Roma. It is inside the city of Rome called the city on seven hills or seven mountains where the complete area of the Vatican State is what? Is located. Those seven heads are representing the seven hills. Geography pointing directly at it. And it has ten heads. Why ten? What is ten that ten head horns, those ten horns represent? The division of what? When the Roman Empire broke off, the western part of the Roman Empire became what we know today as Europe with those ten horns, those ten nations. But prophecy said that that little horn, the papacy, the Antichrist was going to rise up and unpluck three of those ten nations. Did that happen? Oh, yes, it happened. History has confirmed all of this. And it says, The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stole, stones and what? And pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of the abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. When we look at that, the use of purple and scarlet, the official colors of the Vatican, right, of the, of the cardinals and the bishops, and has a, and has a, uh, a golden cup Talking about precious stones and pearls. And this is what? The wealth of the Vatican. It is, it's, it's not, I'm just going to say it, not calculable, right? Is that the word? Correct me. Incalculable, right? It's impossible to calculate with the real estate, the riches. We talked about this. This is just review because we're starting with Revelation chapter 17. And remember, this is the focus, the religious focus on this, institu on this institution. So all of this is just review. We've been talking about this and we've been studying this. And it says there also, and on her forehead, a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the what? The mother of harlots and of the abominations of the what? Here's where it gets interesting, my loved ones. She is the mother of harlots. That means that she has daughters. And these are what? Other churches that are following in the mom's adulterous ways. These are other churches that are listening to this to her mother, and they're following her mother's ways. Is everybody following me? This is where it starts to get deep, my loved ones. It says that she is the mother of harlots and the mother and of the abominations. Now, if you notice in Revelation chapter 17, verse number 2, it says that because of the illicit relationship between the woman and the kings of the earth, that was, there was this wine that was produced, and this wine, product of this fornication, had the whole world drunk. But in Revelation chapter 17, in verse number 4, it says that in that golden cup were the full of the abominations and filthiness of her what? Of her, abom of her fornications. So it says wine, filthiness, abominations where? In that cup that she's holding. Now, first, let's start off. When it says mother, who is the mother church? Who thinks, let's put it that way, that she is the mother church? We don't have to come up here and try to make this up. It comes out of the, their own mouth. Benedict, Vatican, October 31st, 2012. The Catechism of the Catholic Church clearly summarizes this. Faith is an ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical act. The faith of the church precedes, engenders, supports, and nourishes our faith. The church is the mother of all Catholics. The church is the mother of all believers. No one can have God as father who does not have the church as in this coming together, in this ecumenical movement that is the movement to bring together all the churches. You know what the Protestant churches were saying? I'm sorry, I shouldn't take Protestant because they're not protesting anymore. Let's say the other Christian churches. You know what they're saying? Well, we're, we're, we're brothers and sisters. Catholic Church says, no, 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 no. You came out of us. You follow us, right? And we're going to see some of that as it plays out. They're saying we are the mother church. That's why it says she is the mother of what? Of harlots that are participating in the mom's illicit relationship. Is everybody following me? Now, this is what Babylon is, my loved ones. This is how it's starting. It's starting with the coming together, the unity of all Christian denominations. That's the push that the Vatican is doing. 
First, they want to bring all the churches together. And then after all the churches are united here in the United States specifically, then they want to bring together the whole world. That's what Babylon is. Babylon is this new world. That's what it's called in the world, right? New world order. But the Bible calls it Babylon. And who is at the head or at the top of Babylon? The Vatican, the papacy. Now, once again, this is not what I'm saying. Let's come out of their own, their own uh, documents. Decree on ecumenism is called Unitatis Redintegratio, Second Vatican Council, 1964. And what did they say? The restoration of unity among all Catholics. Among who? All Christians is one of the principal concerns of the Second Vatican Council. Christ the Lord founded one church and one church only. For it is only through Christ's Catholic Church, which is the all-embracing means of salvation, that they, talking about those that are not in the Catholic Church, they can benefit fully from the means of what? Of salvation. We believe that our Lord entrusted all the blessings of the new covenant to the apostolic college alone, nobody else, of which Peter is the head, in order to establish the one body of Christ on earth to which all should, fully incorporate, should be fully incorporated who belong in any way to the people of God. Since the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s, this has been the goal of the Vatican, right? And if there has been an ecumenical pope around, it is Francis to the 10th power. He is being unbelievable, and we're going to see some of those things as we continue furthermore. So what their purpose is, they want to do what? Bring all of the Christian churches that come on home. Come back, come to mama, come home, get under our wings. This is what we want to be. Now, fascinating, and this is happening right before our eyes, my loved ones. All of the major churches that came out of the Protestant Reformation, the Lutherans, the Anglicans, the Methodists, they have all already signed agreements to join. And that's not just because I'm saying it. We're going to have a video later on in the week where I'm going to show you this in an amazing way how this is happening. But guess who's missing to sign that agreement? The Pentecostal Evangelical Charismatic Movement. This was this meeting right here. Who's in the middle? He's not on the side. He's not in the back looking up. He's in the middle. And everybody's standing around him. And these are the main leaders, the most powerful leaders in the United States from the evangelical Pentecostal charismatic movement. That one right there, I guess you should know, he's probably the most famous, Kenneth Copeland, right? And we're going to see a video in where the Pope sends a direct message to the, this council of evangelical Pentecostal charismatic leaders that are meeting, and he invites them and he says, let's get together and form one church. Let's get together and do this. And the response that they give is amazing. Amen? This is happening. They have sent a tentative date, which is October 31st, 2016. That's my loved ones almost a year from now. At the same time is also the year of mercy, where the Pope is extending the mercy of the Catholic Church because we are so merciful. We don't want to continue in our old ways where we force people. Now we want it to do mercy. A year of mercy for who? And we're going to talk about that document, and that document clearly states that that year of mercy is for who? For those that have aparted or separated from the mother church. The question is, what's going to happen after that year? Ooh, it's getting interesting, amen? This is getting very interesting. And this is the situation. This is what's going on, my loved ones. We saw earlier today the keys of this blood. Pope John Paul II versus Russia and the West for control of the new world order. This is a book by Malachi Martin, once again, a Jesuit priest, a Jesuit scholar. And what did he write in his book? The goal of John Paul II, and I would say the goal of the papacy, is a geopolitical structure for the society of nations designed and maintained in accordance with the ethical and doctrinal outlines of Christianity as taught and propagated by Jesus Christ. No, by the Roman pontiff as who? The vicar of Christ, Vicario Philidei 666, the one that is in the place of Christ on earth. This is the goal. Geopolitical movement, what does that mean? To bring of all the nations together. One church, one government. Who is going to be the head of that system? Who do you think it's going to be? Papa. 
right? That's who is going to be at the head. Whoops. Is everybody with me? And this is what we're seeing. This is what we're seeing being fulfilled before our very eyes. Everybody following me? And this is the Pope where? United Nations. Where is the United Nations? Where all the governments come together. And Papa showed up, and what happened? Everybody stood up in a standing ovation, right? A standing ovation. And that word Papa, that's even a blasphemy. You know that, right? Because even, even Obama and the presidents, they call him the Holy Father. And the Bible clearly states you should only call Father, spiritual Father, God in heaven. Amen? And we're seeing these things as they continue to unravel. And there he was in front of who? In front of the United Nations giving a speech and basically lecturing. He's been lecturing the world on economics, on politics, on social. He's been lecturing everybody. Right? This is not politic. This is not just religious. Jesus Christ did not get involved in the political problems of his time. He said, leave that alone. That doesn't matter. That's going to pass. What we need to focus on is in saving people's lives, is having people come to Christ and give their lives over. That should be the focus of the church, not getting involved in politics. And we saw that that is biblical, and they broke that off, and that is what is going to happen. As the United States is going to lift the image up for the papacy, they're going to restore it. And this unity, we're seeing it happen in front of our very eyes, right? They're walking around like newlyweds. They are in love, the papacy and the Vatican, all the time. And it doesn't matter, it's, it, it really doesn't matter if it's Obama and Francis. Whoever's in office, they're cuddling. They're getting together. They're doing what they have to do. But of course, they knocked off Russia, the Soviet Union. They're like, look how powerful we are. Nobody can stop us, right? Sadly, this is what's happening, my loved ones. And this is the image that the United States shall raise up. How? How is this country founded on these principles we talk about going to do this with the pressure of who? of the churches they're going to push the government to start to impose laws to impose laws that seem religious and they're going to say we have to unite that's why first the churches are coming together and then after that happens with the influence that we saw that pope the popes already have in this country this is just going to get stronger and stronger through who through congress isn't that what happened my loved ones this is happening before our very eyes and we're going to see this as it continues and continues and those two back in the back right Vice President Biden and Joe Boehner, guess what? Catholics. The leaders of the House and the, and the Senate are Catholics. That's why he was invited. We saw the Supreme Court, six out of nine, Catholics. The presidency, they have the government in their hands. The papacy has the government in their hands. It's just a matter of time, but he's little by little, he's winning, winning people over. Is everybody with me? And this is what we're seeing now. This is where it gets interesting because it says that this Babylon harlot is going to fornicate with the kings of the earth and from that illicit relationship with the kings of the earth, there's going to be produced this wine or this abominations, right? Or this filthiness that's going to have the world how? Drunk. Now that's all a symbolic language. Let's see how it looks out and how it plans out literally. Here's a little chart that I made. Babylon the harlot and her daughters is going to fornicate or commit adultery with who? With the kings of the earth. This is going to produce this wine or abominations and filthiness that has the world what? Drunk. If we look at the literal fulfilling of this, the Vatican and her daughter churches is going to come into covenants and alliances, right? With the nations and government of the world. This has happened in the past and this is going to happen again. And this is going to produce doctrines, teachings, practices, and laws that are going to what? Confuse people and deceive them in regards to the plan of salvation. That's what Revelation 17 is warning us about. Now, why is this important? Because we need to identify who are the other players in Babylon. Everybody with me? We need to know who the other players in Babylon are because God is telling us to come out of Babylon because Babylon is the unification of all of this coming together. And you think, well, it's impossible that the majority of Christians, when have the majority been with Christ? Never. And God, God, Jesus Christ, warns us. He says, don't go where the majority are going because the path to perdition is wide and most people are going down that path. And the path to salvation is very narrow and very few are going to walk. And he's talking to the church. Not because you say, Lord, Lord, are you going into heaven, but those that do the will. So we cannot go by the majority. The only thing that we must follow as the lamp on our feet is the word of God. Amen? 
this is what's going to happen, and this is nothing new. It might be new here, but this is nothing new in the rest of the world in history. This is the warning. Now, what we have to do then is focus in on these teachings, these practices, these doctrines, this wine, these abominations, because this is produced by Babylon. By the mother. And these wines and teachings, she has harlot daughters because they're following her mother's what? Doctrines, teachings, and practices. For the next three presentations after tonight, we are going to be talking about these abominations. Because what? This will help us identify Babylon. And when we see Babylon, what do we need to do? Run. Get out of her. Amen? Walk away from her. Doesn't matter what we think, it's what the Bible is trying to tell us and warn us. Now, the word abomination in Hebrew is the word shakats, which means filthy, dirty, polluted, detestable. In Greek, it's the word bedluso, which means smelly, disgusting, loathing. That means that these abominations are things that God, what? He dislikes. Nothing abominable entered into the sanctuary. Nothing abominable ever entered inside of the sanctuary in the presence of God. God said, don't bring strange and common things in my presence. Not because God is afraid of them. It's because God will consume anything that is not pure in his presence. If we are going to enter into the presence of God, my loved ones, it's not how we think or how we want or how I was shown. It's how God says we are going to return. Amen? And these are very stern warnings that God is trying to teach us. Follow and pay attention to these things. Amen? Now, we are going to start to break down these abominations. And I want to be, tell you, I'm going to be very honest with you. The things that we are going to be coming for the next three nights, it's not going to be easy. If the, if the first beast hurt and the second beast hurt, these other things might hurt also. Right? But remember, God is not a butcher. A butcher cuts to kill and to eat. God is a surgeon. God is telling us these things because he wants us to walk away from them. He wants us to be prepared. Amen? He loves us, and he's trying to show us and identify, get out of wherever this is happening. Is everybody following me? Let's not commit the same mis mistake that Adam and Eve did in Genesis chapter 3, verse 5, when it says, For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like who? Like God. What does it mean to be like God? To declare good and evil. Who is the only one that declares what's good and evil? Who is the only one that says what's holy and not holy? Who is the only one that says what's clean and unclean? God, not us. And Adam and Eve took that position. They said, thank you, God, but from now on on, we are going to determine what's right and wrong. We don't need you to tell us what's good and, what's good and wrong. And that's what, what? Today, sadly, most people in the world, and I'm going to tell you this, most Christians say, thank you, Lord, but I want to do my thing. Right? Some out of ignorance, some out of innocence. But God is telling us in the end times, this is it. I'm bringing this forth because I want my people to come out of her and be prepared. Amen? So let's start looking at some of the abominations as we start uh, studying these things. So I'm going to start with a, with a light one, all right? I'm just going to give you a small touch on a light one. Go with me, please, to Proverbs 28. Proverbs, if you open the Bible halfway as we start studying the abominations, as, as I said, the mark of the beast we are going to see on Tuesday is the worst of the abominations is the worst of these teachings and doctrines that have come out from the mother church and that have spread to her daughters. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 9. Proverbs, if you open Psalms, right after Psalms, you'll find Proverbs. Proverbs, I'm telling you and I can't even get there. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 9. Amen? Here's an abomination. One who turns away his ear from hearing what? The law. Even his prayer is an abomination. When you know what God is asking you, when you know what God is telling you, and God is saying, if you love me, keep my commandments, and you choose to say, you know what? I want to do my own thing. Thank you. I don't really need that. That is what? Those prayers are abominable for the Lord. Because remember that when you disobey God, what are you telling God? Thank you for everything you've done for me. Thank you for all the blessings. Thank you for creating me. Thank you for everything you've done. But from now on, I want to do my thing. I don't need you to tell me. And what does God do? He respects your decision, but he steps aside because that's what you have asked. By disobeying God, you're telling him, I can do my own thing. Thank you. I don't need you in my life. 
And God respects that decision. Everybody with me? Let's go to another one. This is a light one. Deuteronomy chapter 27. The abominations are all over the Bible. And they're there for a reason. They're not just there because they're pretty. Deuteronomy chapter 27 verse 15. Deuteronomy chapter 27 verse 15. It says, Cursed is the one who makes a carved or molded image, an abomination to the Lord, the works of the hands of the craftsman, and sets it up in secret. Talking about what? Idol? Idol worship. Creating images, creating these things, and worshiping them, these are what? Abominations to the Lord. Amen? Now, let's get into a little bit deeper waters. Go with me, please, to Deuteronomy chapter 14. Deuteronomy chapter 14, and we're going to read verses 2 and 3. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 2 and 3. What are the abominations that we have to watch out? Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 2 says, For you are a what? A holy people to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for himself. A special treasure above all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Praise the Lord. Amen? Who wants to be God's special people among all the earth? Verse number three. You shall not eat anything detestable, any detestable thing. The word there that goes is abominable. You shall not eat anything abominable. Now, here we go. Uh Uh-oh. Carlos, you're not going to get involved with food. Oh, no, 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 no. I would not dare do a thing like that. It's the Lord that is saying, you shall not eat anything abominable, anything detestable. Is everybody with me? Now, the question is, what are those things that the Lord says, do not eat them because they are an abomination. They are disgusting. They are filthy for me. Is everybody ready? Everybody ready? Let's go to Leviticus chapter 11. Leviticus chapter 11. Leviticus chapter 11, we're going to start on verse number 1. Leviticus chapter 11. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Amen? The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying to them, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, These are the animals which you may eat among all the animals that are on the earth, among the animals whatever divides the hoof. Having cloven hooves and chewing the cud that you may eat. Nevertheless, these you shall not eat among those that chew the cud or those that have cloven hooves. The camel, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. The rock, what is that word? Yeah, that one. Because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. The hare, because it chews, it chews the cud, but does not have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. And the swine, or the pig, though it divides the hoof, having the cloven hooves, you does, yet does not chew the cud, is unclean to you. Their flesh you shall not eat, and their carcasses you shall not touch. They are unclean to you. The word there again is abominable. Now, Why does God say, do not eat swine, do not eat pig? They're so cute. They're so beautiful. Look at the little cuddly things, right? Why is it that God tells us not to eat these things? Why? Isaiah chapter 65, verse 1 through 5. I was sought by those who did not ask me. I love these verses. This is a powerful, this is God reaching out. I was sought by those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that was not called by my name. I have stretched out my hand all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, according to their own thoughts, a people who what? Who provoke me to anger continually to my face. God is reaching out saying, oh, I am so patient and loving and merciful with these people, but they do not want to follow me. They want to live by their own thoughts. Who are they? 
who eat swine's flesh and the broth of abominable things in their vessels, who say, keep to yourself, do not come near to me. Why is the Bible telling us not to eat unclean animals, abominable animals, especially talking about swine? Because that's exactly what they are. They are pigs. They are swine. In Spanish, there's like 10 words that describe them, and none of them are pretty or nice. Because a pig is exactly that, a pig. It eats anything. There are stories from the mafia that when they would take their victims, they would cut them up in pieces and to take them out, to, to, to eliminate the evidence, they would feed them to the pigs and the hogs and all of these different type of animals. Why? Pigs, my loved ones, don't sweat. They have two small sweating glands right here at the bottom of their hoofs. They don't sweat. That means that all of the things that they're eating and all of the impurities are going where? They're staying inside the body. So when you eat that, what is happening with all of those things? It is staying inside, right? The phrase, well, you are what you eat. God is not telling us not to eat pigs because he has a chicken factory and he doesn't want competition. God is telling us not to eat pigs because he loves us and he doesn't want us to get sick. He doesn't want us to get sick from these animals because God did not create them with that purpose. God did not create any animal with the purpose of being eaten, right? But when he did give the purpose, he gave them permission in Noah's ark. Why did he do it? Because they were going to be on the ark for over a year and there was impossible to have any type of vegetation. And God gives them permission to eat what type of animals? Clean animals. He makes seven of each, but of the pig and the unclean one, only one. Only one pair. Why only one? Because they weren't meant to eat. Guess what they were doing on the ark? Cleaning up the rest of the filth from the other animals. That's what they were there for. And if you notice, right after the ark, the Bible says that the lifespan of humans was what? Almost a thousand years. As soon as they started eating meat uh, and clean meat, what happened to the lifespan? Drastically dropped, right? And God says, no more will you live more than 120 years. That was out of love and mercy for us. Because imagine now if we lived 120 years and look at the conditions that we are in society. Imagine if we lived a thousand years. What would be of us? Whew, that would be torturous. God in his love and mercy shortened our lives. But God is telling us not to eat these unclean animals because he, because he loves us, my loved ones. Amen? He loves us. And some people say, well, God is not going to judge me based on what I eat. Well, that's what you say. What does God say in his word? Isaiah chapter 66, verse 15 through 7. For behold, the Lord will come in fire and his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. That doesn't sound very nice. What's going to happen to those that are going to receive this? For the Lord will judge with fire and with his sword all flesh and those slain by the Lord shall be many. And who are those? Eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together, says who? I didn't say it, the Lord said. Now why? You, my loved ones, once again, it doesn't have to do with the tree. It doesn't have to do with the day. It doesn't have to do with a plate of food. It has to do with who is the God that you love, honor, and obey. Amen? And he says, when you love me, you will obey me and listen to me. And you will follow what I am trying to teach you, my loved ones. Amen? God is trying to tell us because he is worried and he is concerned about our health. He wants us to be healthy. He wants us to avoid these things. He wants us because he loves us and he wants to take care of us to the best of his power. Amen? And that's why God says pigs and anything that had to do with a pig or any abominable animal, once again, never came close to the sanctuary. Never came close. Now, we have not finished. Let's go back to Leviticus chapter 11. And once again, my Bible was closed. Leviticus chapter 11. And we stopped at verse number 8. Let's go to verse number 9. These you may eat of all that are where? In the water. Whatever in the water has fins and scales, whether in the sea or in the rivers, that you may eat. But in all the seas or on the rivers that do not have fins and scales, all that move in the water, or any living thing which is in the water, they are a what? An abomination to you. They shall be an abomination to you, and you shall not eat their flesh, but you shall regard their carcasses as what? An abomination. Whatever in the water does not have fins or scales, you shall, that shall be an abomination to you. Now I have a question. 
Let's look at this. Do sharks, do sharks have fins? Yes. Do they have scales? No. So they are not meant to eat, right? Salmon, fins, scales? Yes. How about these young fellows right here? Oh, no, Carlos, please don't do this. Oh, my loved ones. Remember, I wasn't raised a Christian, all right? And I love, you know what the, my two favorite meals and foods were? Pork and these guys. Lobster. Cal I lived in Puerto Rico. We're on the island. Calamari, oysters, right? Uh, uh, crabs. Oh, that was my favorite. Yet my loved ones, neither of them qualify as clean animals or clean water, clean animals in the water to eat. And you know why, once again? It's not because God has a Chick-fil-A franchise. It's because God is trying to tell us something. You know who all of these are cousins of? The cockroach. They are the water cockroaches. They are the bottom feeders. Once again, they are doing what? They're called as un unclean animals. There's a word for the bottom feeders. I forgot the word in English. Scavengers, that's the word, right? That's what a pig is, and that's what these animals are. Once again, God is telling us, do you know anybody that eats any of these foods and has somehow had a bad experience? Oh, I know a lot of people, right? God is telling us, don't eat these animals, please, all right? Why? Once again, God loved us. And when I found out, now I told you already, I mentioned that the, the most disgusting thing in the earth to me is a cockroach. So when I learned and I found out that these were the cousins of the cockroach, I said, no mas, no more. <laughs> I do not want to have anything to do. Now, my loved ones, I want you to understand this. I used to love this food. I used to yearn for this stuff. And when I come to the Bible and learn these things, it's painful, right? It hurts. But I said something to the Lord. I said, Lord, I'm going to give it to you all or nothing. I didn't understand when I came across these things. I didn't understand why God said them. I'm like, why? But I didn't care whether I understood or not. I trusted in the Lord. Because I know that the Lord knows more and better than me. And if he's telling me not to eat these things, he's what? It's because he loves me. And as I've grown in my walk, I've come to understand why. And you see so many of the health situations that we have, right? It's because of the things that we're, that we're eating. Now, some people come to me, Carlos, you have a problem because Paul and Peter clearly say, kill and eat, right? Kill and eat. And that's what most people say. It doesn't matter what you eat. Just kill and eat. I'm going to give you the context of every time Paul or Peter talks, and we're going to look at one of the examples. Paul and Peter are what? They're Jews, right? Now, the, when they're talking about eating or food, they can't be talking about unclean animals because unclean animals are is not food for them. Are you following me? I'll give you a perfect example. Let's say after the meeting, I said, guys, come down. I have, uh, I have a buffet for all of you. And we come down, and I start opening up those, can those, uh, those pots, and you have monkey brain, right? You have dog and cat stew. You have all of these, weird, and you're like, now, if I open the pots and I said, here's monkey brain, here's cat, uh, cat fried cat, here's a... Uh, 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 fricassee of, 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 of rice and, and dog, I have a question. Would you eat that? Now, there's always one or two that would eat anything, right? We know that. <laughs> but Mike, seriously, if you know what that was, would you eat it? No. Why? Because that's not food for us. That's not food for us. So automatically the foundational principle of when Peter, Paul, or any of them are talking, when they talk about food and eating, they're not going to be talking about what? These abominable or unclean animals because it's not food for them. Now, we're going to look. There's a number of examples that we can look at, but if we apply this principle and really understand the context, it's very easy. Remember we said when you take a verse out of, out of, uh, a verse out of context is a, is a pretext, Right? Let's look it into context and let's study Acts chapter 10. Go with me to Acts chapter 10. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts. Now in Acts, we have a fascinating example of something that happens regarding food. And this is one of the verses, once again, my loved ones, when I come to study the Bible, I say, you know what? I don't know if I can or I cannot. Whatever you say, Lord, that's where I'm going down the road. Acts chapter 10. Go with me to Acts chapter 10, please. I'm going to have to pull out my Bible. 
In Acts chapter 10, we have a fascinating scene in which where Peter is hungry, right? Acts chapter 10, we're going to start on verse number 9. Everybody there? These are some of the verses that are used to justify that you can eat anything that it doesn't matter. Well, my Bible tells me differently. The next day, as they went out through the journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Then he, came, he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they, made ready, he, while they made ready, he fell into a trance. That means he's seeing a what? A vision. And saw heaven open, an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals on the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, rise, Peter, what? Kill and eat. Who was speaking to Peter? God was. But Peter said, no, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean or anything abominable, right? God tells Peter through this vision, Peter, eat. And Peter says what? No, Lord, I have never eaten anything unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times and the object was taken up into heaven again. Now God tells Peter very directly through this vision, eat, eat, kill and eat, kill and eat. And Peter says, no, no, Lord, I've never done these things. Why is Peter confused? He's confused because he knows God is not going to contradict himself. If an animal was clean, unclean over there, it's still unclean today, right? The death of Jesus Christ does not make those animals change the difference whether they're clean or unclean. They're still filthy animals. And God, and I'm going to make another point. They're probably more filthy now than they were in the times of the, Christ, of, of the early church, right? Because now you have all this pollution, all of these hormones, all of these things entering into all of these animals. And even the clean animals are a health hazard today. So imagine in this times, imagine now they're more unclean and more unfilthy. But let's continue. Verse 17. Now while Peter wondered within himself what this vision what this vision which had been sent. Behold, a man who had been sent from Cornelius and made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. Now, if God, Peter would have understood clearly that God says, Peter, go eat. Peter would have said, you know what, Lord, I'm hungry. I'm going to go have some pork chops. I'm going to go grab something to eat because I am hungry. But he understands. And what does it say here? Now, while Peter wandered within himself what this vision was. What was happening with Peter? He was thinking about it. He was struggling with this. He was saying, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. The Lord's telling me to eat, but I've never eaten anything. Is the Lord going to tell me to eat unclean foods? Peter has this inner struggle. He didn't run completely. Now, that was a vision. That means that it was what? He was trying to, God was trying to show Peter what? A lesson. He was trying to show him something, and let's go now. Go with me, please, to verse number 25, 24. Here's the explanation of that vision. See, people sometimes, they stay stuck on a verse. Don't read the context. Verse number 20, 23. Then invited them in and lodged them. On the next day, Peter went away with them, and some brethren from, Jop from Joppa accompanied him. And the following day, they entered into Caesarea. I'm trying to say it in English, but I can't. Now Cornelius was waiting for them, and he can call together his relatives and close friends. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. And Peter said, praise the Lord, because I am the first pope, and you are to bow down and worship me. Is that what Peter said? Notice this. Who is supposed to be the first pope, and do we see human beings bow down and kneel in front of the pope and kiss his finger? Right? That's a form of worship, my loved ones. Not even angels say, no, 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 no. What is Peter's response to Cornelius doing this? But Peter lifted him up and said, stand up. I myself am also a man. Amen? Amen? Clearly establishing some very strong principles. No, 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 no. Don't do that to me. Now notice, Cornelius was what? A Gentile, a Roman Gentile, right? And for a Jew, a Gentile was an unclean person, was an abomination. They did not have anything to do with them. It says in verse number 26, But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together. Then he said to them, Peter, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one another to one of another nation. 
But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or... When did God show him that? With the vision. Amen? God was not telling him, go out and run and have yourself some pork chops. He was trying to show him, don't call the Gentiles unclean anymore. Amen? And that's why he says, Peter then says, after he battles with himself, the next day he says, ah, that's what God was showing me. Hasn't that happened to you? You're like, God, what are you trying to tell me? And then the next day a situation happens. He goes, oh, now I got it. Amen? That's the situation, my loved ones. And there are a number of different verses where people use and try to justify that they can clean. My loved ones, God does not contradict himself. If these animals were unclean in the past, they are even more and worse unclean today because of what we are talking about. Amen? And if you've noticed through the health magazines that we've given you and through the videos that we're seeing, right, we are focused here at the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We have a heavy focus on clean living, especially on eating, right? And we promote, I want you to hear the word, we promote the best lifestyle, not because we say it, but it because it is proven through scientific studies that the best and healthiest lifestyle is a plant-based whole wheat type of diet. Amen? Now, it takes time, my loved ones, right? But I have a question for you. God loves you so much that he wants us to what? He wants us to be healthy. Amen? And he's telling us, I want you to be healthy. I love you. Now, I'm not saying run out now and, 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 and throw everything out. What I'm saying is, ask God to guide you in what we are eating. Amen? Why? Because there are very specific principles in the Bible regarding this. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. Know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. For you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which is the mind, which are what? My loved ones, when you decide to give your life over to Jesus Christ, you do not belong to yourself anymore. Amen? And God is asking us, he's telling us, stay away from these unclean animals. Amen? And try to eat a more balanced, a more healthy lifestyle. Try to take care of yourself because I love you and I want you to be a good example, a good testimony to others. Amen? So I ask you and I, what I'm saying is that when, you, when we walk to, with Christ, say, Lord, is there anything in my life that is... That, is, that does not worship or glorify you? Is there anything there that it can harm me? And ask God, definitely unclean animals, amen? And we know of a number of other things that we can clearly take off the plate, which are drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, right? And all of those things that are stimulants that are bad for our health. Now these things, notice my loved ones, they're very addictive, amen? The enemy knows these things. But what has God given us? He's given us the power of the Holy Spirit to what? To ask him, Lord, if this is unhealthy for me, if this is not good for me, help me to walk away and God will give us the power. Amen? God will help us to walk away from those things. And I am a pure testimony regarding cigarettes, regarding all of those addictive things. The Lord showed me and gave me the power to walk away from those things and I have been staying away from them. Amen? And my health, my body says, thank you, Carlos. Thank you. My mind says thank you. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. God is trying to tell us, your body belongs to me. Now you do not live by yourself based on what you want. Now you belong to me, and I want to use you, like we read in Deuteronomy, in a special way. You are my holy children. You are mine. You belong to me. And I want to use you to reflect my character to the world so the world can see what it is to walk with me. Amen? And that's what God is talking us about. He's telling us, and he's not only worried about all aspects of our life, but especially our health and our mind because it's with your mind that you worship. And what you eat, does it affect how you think? Oh, yes. We're going to be talking about that a little later on too. God is worried about all aspects, and he's telling us to walk away from these things. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. Then eat and drink, or whatever you do, do all for who? For the glory of God. Now, I know people that say, oh, there you go. It doesn't matter what I eat or drink as long as I give glory to God. That's not what he's talking about. Because if I take a mouse and I put him on a plate and I fry him, and I say, oh, Lord, all the glory be to you, and I eat it, that does not mean that that mouse is not unclean. It's still the same filthy animal that it was. Everybody follow me? It's saying that whatever we eat and drink, whatever we do, we should do what? It should be based on God's word and we're giving glory to him because we're obeying him. We're listening to him and we're seeing what God is doing in our lives. 
we should want to, my loved ones, to step away from the things that we know are harmful. Amen? And all I do is I invite you. And I'll invite you immediately to stay away from the unclean foods. Amen? But I'll invite you to say, the Lord, help me to have a healthier lifestyle. Help me, Lord, to eat things that are going to help me, that are going to nourish my body, my mind, and be healthier. Why? Because I want to have a clearer understanding of your word. I want to be able to serve you in a better way. And it's never too late, my loved ones. Amen? It's never too late. Those eight health laws that we've been talking about that are in the magazine, that are in the health nuggets, those are proven scientifically to help and, and the quality of a human being's life on all levels. Amen? And this is what we're talking about. God loves you and he wants you to be healthy. Who can say amen to that? Amen. amen. Praise the Lord. And this is what we're talking about, my loved ones. Now, I'm going to just move forward here because it says in Leviticus 18, 29, for whoever does, does any of these abominations... The person that do them shall be what? Caught off from among his people. God is trying to tell us something about these abominations. God is saying these things do not please me. And God wants us because he loves us and he wants to take care of us. And he's asking us, stay away from the abominations of Babylon. What are one of these abominations? That you can eat and drink whatever you want, right? I know Christians that say that. Oh, it doesn't matter what you eat or drink. It doesn't matter. I'm like, yes, it does. There's very strict guidelines in the Bible, and we're seeing through science that there are other things that are doing us harm, right? We should want to stay away from those things. Titus chapter 1, verse 16, they profess to know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. God is trying to tell us, please, my loved ones, if you love me, if you want to honor me and you want to obey me, stay away from these abominations that we have started tonight, and we're going to see as they continue to come up. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1 through 3. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, with the same spirit, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. Amen? That's you're not living in the flesh anymore. It's not what I like, what I want. Is God is telling us, these are the things, my loved ones, that I want you to do. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in what? in lewdness, in lust, in drunkenness, in revelries, in drinking parties, in abominations and idolatry. My loved ones, God is waiting for a people that are going to cleanse every part of their lives. Amen? Everything God wants us to submit to his will and say, follow me. Why? Because God is going to end with this world. And those that have submitted all their lives, submitted their will to follow God and to pay attention, God is going to grant them the things of their heart if they are searching for heaven. But if sometimes I say it, uh, that I, I, I'm not going to give up my salvation for a plate of food, right? I told you my testimony. I, to, I struggled with these things too. I thought that this was it. But God said, no, Carlos, that's enough. I don't want you to eat those things. I want you to walk away from the unclean meats and anything else that you know that can be harmful to you. Walk away from them. Why? The Lord is waiting. The Lord is not slack late concerning his promise as some count slackness, but is long-suffering or patient towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to what? To repentance. God is calling us out of Babylon. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Come out of her, my people, that you may be partakers of, may not be partakers of her sin, and that you not receive her plagues. What are these abominations, my loved ones? Tonight we have begun. And this might be a heavy topic because a lot of people have no problems with some of the other things that we've been teaching. But when it comes to my fridge, oh, Carlos, don't. My loved ones, I didn't touch your fridge. It was the Lord. The Lord was the one that said, stay away from unclean meats. Stay away from these things. My people do not live like the other ones live. Amen? You are special. Come out of her. And this is one of the teachings of Babylon. Eat and drink. Do whatever you want. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says, your body is mine. Listen to me and obey me. Amen? And my question tonight is, is there anyone today that wants to say and look at the cross? Look at Jesus Christ and look what, after what he's done. He, hasn't, he didn't die on the cross so that we can continue to live in our own ways. He died on the cross to give us a new way, a new path, a new lifestyle that leads through the sanctuary and leads us back into the presence of the Father, my loved ones. And notice that in the sanctuary... Nothing abominable ever entered. Amen? So my question tonight, is there anybody here that wants to say, not only do I want to clean my, my house from anything that does not honor the Lord, but I also want to clean my refrigerator. I want to clean 
my food. I, anything that does not honor the Lord, I want to take that out. Is anybody there? Stand up in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Anybody else that wants to say, I want to get rid of those things that I know that are not healthy, that the Lord is asking me to take out. Is there anyone here that wants to say, I want to get rid of them? Now, I know it's a struggle. It's a battle, right? Especially because these, these companies, they put addictive stuff in the food to make us addicted, in case you didn't know that. They're to make you coming back. But God is telling you, I will give you the power of the Holy Spirit so that you can walk and you can walk away from these things. Amen? Anybody else that wants to say, I want to cleanse my house, both from everything, not only food, anything that does not honor the Lord, I want to walk away from those things. Amen? Praise the Lord. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for tonight we have begun another part of this prophecy seminar as we're looking into Babylon and we're seeing her doctrines, her abominations, her teachings. And we ask, Father, that you help us that you help us because we know that some of these things are on our plates. And boy, the day tastes good, Lord. But it's not about our taste buds. It's about honoring and worshiping and, and following you. And we know that if you have asked us to step away from these things, it's because you, you love us. And you want us not to eat these abominable things. You want us not to eat these things that are unclean. Father, help us so that we can not only cleanse our body, but we can cleanse our homes, we can cleanse our families from anything that does not give you honor and place, Father. Thank you for guiding us and being with us. And we ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. Don't move. Tomorrow at 7 o'clock. At 7 o'clock. What time? I just said that. The enemy's greatest lie what? <laughs> Revealed. Amen? Tomorrow we're going to jump in. We're going to study an abomination. That is fascinating. This is a lie that most Christians have chewed on and most Christians believe, but it's not what we think. It's what God is teaching us. Amen? We're going to study that. Tonight, you're going to take home the study guy, the other woman. Amen? I'm going to send you the notes. I owe you the notes from last night, this morning, and today, so you're going to get quite a lot of information. Keep on studying. Keep on coming. Tomorrow, we're going to study, and I want to thank all of you for coming. There is one promise, though, that I never want you to forget when you walk out of this door. Amen? No matter how hard things might appear, no matter what difficulties you have in your life, in your household, in your marriage, at job, at your work, if you don't have a job, God is telling you one thing. And what is that promise in Isaiah 41.10? Do not fear, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will always help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And who is at the righteous right hand of the Father? Praise the Lord. Who wants to make this promise yours? Who wants to hold on to this? There's something else that we need to do than to claim this promise from heaven. And what is that? Matthew 6, what does it say? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Make God first in your life, first with yourself, with your marriage, with your children, with your home. Dedicate your home and your life to God. And God says, if you do that, if you turn over to me your life, I will give you everything you need and more, and I will always be with you and strengthen you. Amen? Thank you for coming out. I'll see you tomorrow at 7 o'clock. God bless you.